Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm Christina Foxley, the Director of Events, and I'm very pleased to welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best-selling author John Darnton and his son-in-law, David Graham, here tonight to talk about John's memoir, Almost a Family, about his lifelong chase after his father's shadow. John Darnton has worked for The New York Times for 40 years as a reporter, editor, and foreign correspondent. He is the recipient of two George Polk Awards and a Pulitzer Prize. He is also the author of five novels, including The Darwin Conspiracy and the bestseller Neanderthal. David Graham is a st staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of the books The Devil and Sherlock Holmes, Tale of Murder, Tales of Murder, Madness, and Obsession, and the New York Times bestselling The Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon. Following your discussion, John and David will take your questions. I'll be walking around with this microphone, so please wait for that before you speak. They will then stick around to sign books which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming the talented in-laws, David Graham and John Darnton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As both a uh, writer and as uh, John Darton's uh, son-in-law, I am incredibly honored to be able to uh, moderate this panel with him tonight. Um, <laughs> His, his book is extraordinary, uh, and John has long been one of the most distinguished and highly regarded writers and editors and journalists in America. Throughout his career as a reporter, he has devoted himself often at great risk to the pursuit of the facts, and the facts of John's career certainly speak for themselves. In 1966, he began as a copy boy at the New York Times, joining what was in effect a family calling. His father, Barney, was a famed foreign correspondent, and as we'll get into in the uh, discussion, uh, died while covering uh, World War II when John was not yet one years old. His mother was also a reporter at the Times and one of the first women editors uh, in the country. John quickly rose uh, to reporter. Uh, he seemed to adhere to what uh, his father uh, once said in a, in a beautiful letter uh, which is quoted in the book, uh, that journalism, despite its flaws, remains an indispensable force, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, that can't all be privileged without any duty. In 1975, John became a foreign correspondent and moved to Nigeria with his wife, Nina, and their children. There, he began to document the Nigerian government's systemic repression and corruption. And after only 18 months in the country, he was promptly thrown in jail and expelled from the country with his family uh, for quote-unquote stories that were unfavorable uh, to the Nigerian government. Undaunted, he then moved to uh, Kenya. Uh, and over the years, uh, he covered the civil war in Rhodesia, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and the fall of Idi Amin in Uganda. His meticulous reporting and incisive dispatches earned him his first George Polk Award. Now, uh, after that, uh, John uh, received a posting uh, in Poland where he found himself in one of the most chaotic and important moments in history, uh, the Solidarity Movement in Poland and the imposition of martial law. To evade government censors, he had to smuggle his copy out of the country. Uh, and this time, uh, his extraordinary reporting earned him not only another George Polk Award, but also a Pulitzer Surprise. Or prize. <laughs> <laughs> surprise is more accurate. <laughs> yeah, it seems that no matter what John did, he excelled at. Uh, he eventually returned uh, to the Times, where he was an editor. Now, reporters uh, make uh, notoriously bad editors, uh, but John was a beloved figure inside the Times, and he went on to serve as Metropolitan Editor, as well as uh, Deputy Foreign Editor, and he was the longtime uh, Culture Editor. Now, for most people, this would have been enough, but at a certain point, John said, well, why don't I try my hand at fiction as well? Uh, now, it is often said that every novelist has a, every journalist has a novel waiting to be born that shouldn't be. Uh, but in John's case, that was an exception. His first book, Neanderthal, went on to become an international bestseller, sold hundreds of thousands of copies, and was also optioned by Steven Spielberg. He has since written four other acclaimed novels, including The Darwin Conspiracy and uh, Black and White and Dead All Over. So these uh, are some of the basic facts of John's life. And yet anyone who has read his work or has known John recognizes that there is something much deeper in his character and writing that cannot be summed up in mere data points. He has an unspoken resilience 
and a profound moral character, a spirit that seems to animate everything he does. In his new memoir, Almost a Family, one comes to understand, as I did for the first time, where that mysterious fortitude comes from. The book describes his quest after time from the times to better understand his father, a man whom he had known only from scraps and myths. And the same, with the same fierce honesty that he displayed as a foreign correspondent, he describes and investigates the devastating impact his father's death had on him, his brother Bob, and his mother. Already the book has received incredible critical praise. The author, Philip Caputo, said, I've read a lot of journalist memoirs, and John Darton's Almost a Family is so far superior to all of them that it is in a class by itself. Susan Cheever, reviewing the book in the Times last Sunday, said, quote, In his wonderful memoir, John Darton has taken this modern form to a new level. She went on to say, his story is excruciatingly personal with painful drama and dreadful sorrow. But as a journalist, he calmly researches the narrative of his life detail by detail. His heart was broken, but his focus is on the facts. And that focus on the facts has been the hallmark of John's brilliant career as a journalist. But as this book demonstrates, it is the spirit of the man who assembled those facts and even transcended, and even transcended them that gives them their extraordinary power. As Gay Tuiz said of John's wrenching story, quote, it is proof that human beings can be scolded by life and yet come through strong, loving, talented, and tough, and still know how to laugh. So I thought to begin, uh, we would, uh, I wanted to cite that letter uh, from your father and, and where he mentioned that journalism is this calling, it's, it's, and it's, it's not something that should just be easy, it's a duty. How was journalism, uh, a re you describe it in the book as almost a religion, how was it a religion, uh, and what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, could I just say first, uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I don't want you to think that because David is my son-in-law that the fix is in. <laughs> uh, he is relentless and tough <laughs> and, and very serious, and I thought he read that introduction that I wrote <laughs> you know, uh, yes, the definition of, of uh, journalism, well, um, just before my father shipped out uh, in February 1942 from San Francisco, he wrote a letter to his brother, Robert, who happened to be, he came from a family of seven uh, siblings in uh, Michigan. And in it, he laid out his reasons for going to war. He had fought in World War I uh, as a, just a recent graduate of high school uh, with the famous 32nd Division, the Red Arrow Division. So he volunteered to go the second time around in World War II. He was already 44. And he wrote this letter to his brother laying out the reasons and saying, uh, these are difficult times and difficult decisions to be made, but I don't want you to think I've gone off half-cocked. That was the phrase he used. Um, I want you to stand advocate for me before the family. And in it, he gave a beautiful description of, I think, of... Uh, the press. And he said, it's not perfect in all its parts, far from it, but I believe that it is by right, given a special place in the Constitution, and we all have to kind of fight for it. That's part of the values that we're fighting for in this war. So um, that was kind of a foundation, that notion of the press as indispensable to a democracy um, that both my brother and I were raised with. And I have many, many memories of uh, being a, a, a young boy and hearing discussions about reporters, and reporters were uh, often in our house. Um, some of her best friends, including uh, Meyer Berger, who was a, a famous reporter for the Times, were often around. So uh, we kind of just um, took all this in by osmosis. And I think the uh, not so subtle suggestion was that my brother was supposed to go on and become the journalist to pick up the mantle. And I was more or less free to do whatever I wanted. And because I used to stop and examine buildings in New York City and like to look through the little holes and, and be a sidewalk superintendent, she had me pegged for an engineer. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. 
Now, at one point uh, in the book, you, you ponder whether you, because of this history and because of this legacy, whether you were acting uh, on your own free will in becoming a journalist, mm -hmm. or whether you were basically um, carrying out a destiny that had already, be, already been written for you. By the end of this experience of, of researching this book, did you feel like you had answered that? Were you acting on your free will? You know, I, I do not feel I have ever really fully answered it in my own mind. Uh, I did not think I would be a journalist at all growing up. Um, and when I took to it, though, I took to it kind of immediately and loved it uh, immediately. Um, but I was also extremely nervous. I felt very nervous the first time uh, I walked into the New York Times as a, just to report for work as a copy boy. Um, how does one ever know really how one arrives at a decision? Uh, it wasn't there in my mind at any point going through college. I never worked for a newspaper in college, the College uh, Daily Cardinal at Wisconsin, which was a good one. Um, but suddenly, uh, when uh, I graduated and married Mina, I realized, you know, we, we both needed jobs. And I applied for a job in publishing and was accepted at McGraw-Hill and didn't feel very excited about it. Uh, and my mother said, well, have you thought of the times? And I said, well, I hadn't really. And she said, well, I know one person there still. I'll place a call. And she did to an assistant managing editor, and they took me on as a copy boy. And then it took sort of two years to, to move up to the ranks of a beginning reporter. But uh, whether or not I really made choices all along is almost impossible to say. I know if I could retrace a map, but I couldn't tell you why I turned left at any one point or right at another point. The, the shadow, uh, the shadow that's always kind of followed you and um, in this book is your father. And, and uh, when you read this book, you will discover that there are just exquisitely written passages, extraordinarily moving, uh, even though um, they're not sentimental, um, but they're exquisitely done. And he has a phrase in the book uh, which I found extremely haunting. And it, it's in reference to his father uh, after his death and how... Um, how he kind of thought of him. He says, there was the presence of absence. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, uh, <clears throat> if anyone in this audience was raised without one of your two natural parents, you might identify with that sense. Um, there's not a vacuum there, because there can't be a vacuum. Uh, a childish imagination abhors a vacuum. So you will fill it with something. And in our case, we were given uh, kind of the raw materials to fill it kind of with a myth, a myth of a perfect man who laid down his life for his country. Um, it turns out myths, I've discovered, are very powerful things. Uh, they can keep you going. They ennoble you. They provide you with moral sustenance and that sense of purpose and even a kind of compass to your direction. But they can also be deadly because they contain untruths. That's really, if you think about it, what a myth is all about. So in my case, uh, I filled that vacuum uh, with what I thought of as uh, kind of the perfect father. And it actually had a force. It wasn't just an absence of a force. It was what I call the presence of an absence. It was something capable of influencing your entire life. I, I compare it to a shadow at noon, where you can't actually see the shadow, but it's at the point in which the sun is it, at its most powerful. Uh, miss it seems to be a central theme of the book and um, the myths that were created within your family and then your quest to peel them back. Uh, another quote uh, from that letter which we discussed that your father Barney wrote to his brother before he set off to the war carried another phrase that became a myth within the family. The quote was, Bob and John, referring to John's brother Bob, uh, can safely be left to her, referring mm -hmm. to the mother. She isn't the stuff that cracks under a bit of difficulty. Now, everyone in your family seemed determined uh, to propagate that myth. How was it wrong and how difficult in talking about how these myths can be deadly for you to try to uphold this myth? Mm -hmm.